Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so this is uh, a talk on depth robust graphs and their cumulative memory complexity. And this is joint work with Jeremiah Blocky and Krzysztof Pietrzak. So I'm going to sort of set the scene a little bit, and that goes as well for this talk and for the next talk. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a complexity notion and, and, and how it's motivated. And this starts with the story of moderately hard functions. So moderately hard functions, you can think of these functions from bit strings to bit strings, are computable by an honest party in reasonable time and space, sequentially. And, um, when, and brute force evaluation should be very expensive uh, for an adversary. So why would you want such a thing? Well, sort of the meta application is to limit the rate of invocations for some critical function. Um, in particular, if you think about password-based cryptography, the critical function that we want to uh, that we want to um, limit the rate of evaluation is guessing a password. So for example, on a password server, you don't store the password, you store the output of a moderately hard function evaluated on the password. That way when someone breaks in, they steal these hashes. Every time they want to guess, they want to do an offline dictionary attack, they want to guess a new password, they first have to evaluate another instance of the moderately hard function. Uh, another example where you want this sort of rate limit on evaluating functions is proofs of work. Uh, for example, the distributed proof of work underlying uh, uh, most cryptocurrencies. Um, also, when, uh, in fact, this was probably one of the earliest examples of moderately hard functions when combating spam um, and also Sybil attacks. So these are all examples where there's some critical function and you try and rate, limit the rate that an adversary can evaluate these functions or cause these functions to be evaluated in the case of uh, combating spam. So why, why would you want memory hardness? Well, in order for, for this notion of moderate hardness, well, in order to see that, um, it's instructive to look at what happens in practice when people try and brute force evaluate these sort of critical functions. So, Really what ends up happening in a lot of cases is that people build custom hardware to evaluate these functions. And in particular, um, ASICs, so application-specific integrated circuits. And this is what's happening in the Bitcoin mining community. community. Uh, it happened with the desk cracker, um, also some really high-end uh, password cracking machines. And really, it always ends up converging on ASICs. And the reason is that for, the, for a lot of types of computation, ASICs provide a financial incentive. And what, what that boils down to is that um, ASICs, like, they give you much more computation in terms of rate of computation per unit per dollar spent, so, so compared to a general purpose CPU, and sometimes on the order of like 10,000 times more. And this is something that, that's not good for us. We, we want something that's more egalitarian, so that, that has less of a gap between the rate of computation for an adversary versus the rate of computation for an honest user on a general purpose CPU. So we want something that's more egalitarian, and um, we want a notion of complexity that approximates the rate of computation on an ASIC in a way that's closer to actual financial costs. And in the VLSI community, people have been looking at notions of efficiency for a while for, for circuits. And a very common one is area time, so AT complexity. So you look at a circuit, you look at the area of the circuit and the time it takes for the circuit to output uh, a value. And um, an observation made by Percival uh, is that um, for ASICs, actually really expensive components on these ASICs on the memory. And this is actually what balances, when you look at just memory, uh, this balances more general purpose computing and ASICs because high speed memory is very expensive for ASICs. So we approximate, we'd like to approximate area time by space time. So this is, uh, for example, what motivated the development of S-Crypt, which is gonna be talked about in the next talk. So recapping, basically what we want from our memory hard functions, it's a memory hard function is a function with a hardness parameter N that can be computed in sequential time, in time n, right? This is what the honest guy's gonna do, and we don't wanna assume he's got any kind of parallelism like an ASIC. But on the other hand, it requires as much parallel space time as possible for any function that satisfies this first property. 
So we kind of want to, for any function that can be computed in n sequential time, we want to maximize the parallel space time required to compute that function. So memory hard functions, uh, they've been around now for a couple of years. And they've essentially, you can view almost all constructions that exist in the literature as a mode of operation over a round function. And almost always this round function is actually a compression function. And uh, so we're going to, it's useful to think about it this way, to abstract it that way, because really the memory hardness property generally comes out of the mode of operation. It's, uh, as long as you, you, know, you mod model your compression function as an ideal uh, compression function, and then you analyze the mode of operation. And that's also the, um, the strategy we'll take in this work. And um, we, can, we can categorize the constructions into two, two broad groups. And it depends on whether the memory access pattern of the honest algorithm that evaluates this MHF has, uh, depends on the input or not. So if the memory access pattern does not depend on the input, then we're, we're speaking of data-independent memory hard functions, or IMHFs. And if it does depend, then data-dependent. So the advantage of IMHFs here is that you, it's much easier to implement them um, without, having, without opening yourself up to cache timing attacks. And if you think about the, the use case of password-based cryptography, this takes on a special importance because the input is the password. So you really don't want to be leaking anything about that input if, if you can. So that's why IMHFs sort of, given, given a choice, you know, IMHFs are better, all things being equal. Although, as, as you'll see, all things are not equal, and that's why we're still interested in DMHFs as well. But this talk will focus on IMHFs. So there's been a lot of constructions, um, and in particular in the context of the password hashing competition, which is... Um, recently ended. Uh, many of the entrants uh, claimed some form of memory hardness. In particular, the winner, winner Argon2i, several of the finalists, um, and other contestants as well. Since then, there's been a few other constructions, notably uh, balloon hashing and um, a recent theoretical construction as well. Um, most of these constructions, almost all of them really, have been designed based on intuition and then uh, analyzed using cryptanalytic techniques. So basically, people put the constructions out there, and then everybody tried to break them. There are a few exceptions to this approach, uh, notably Catena balloon hashing and uh, the recent AS15 construction. In particular, balloon hashing actually has a security proof in the sequential random oracle model. Um, and AS15 goes all the way to the parallel random oracle model. For us, Parallelism is important here because, remember, our adversarial real-world model are ASICs, and ASICs are parallel devices. You could have many instances of your compression function on the ASIC that you can evaluate in parallel. So, trying to nail down a little more precisely what is the right complexity notion here. We, we said that we are really interested in ST, uh, space-time complexity, but we are also looking at adversaries that are parallel adversaries. And there's a bit of a problem, and, and on top of that, these adversaries, they're actually brute force evaluating these functions, right? They're evaluating many, many copies concurrently. And there's a bit of a problem with uh, how ST plays with parallelism and amortization. So imagine, to see, to see what the issue is, imagine you have a function um, or a, a computation, specific computation of a function, that looks like this, has the following memory profile. At the beginning of the computation, there's a spike in memory, and then there's a long tail where you don't need a lot of memory, but you just need a lot of time, you need the sequential time, basically. So this function would have, suppose every, every way to compute this function has this, you know, has this property. This function has high ST complexity, right? Because you've got the high S and you've got a long T. The problem with this is that when you're doing amortization over many instances and you can do things in parallel, you can start to do things like this. When The moment you finish the first instance, like the input, the blue input, you freed up all your memory while you're doing this long tail. So you can start the next input, the green input. And once you finish that spike, you can start the next input, the orange one. And you can, because you can do things in parallel, you can do all these computations in parallel. And the point is, you really haven't increased your space-time complexity by very much. And in fact, this can be quite extreme. So in AS15, there was an example of a function, um, which was, again, a mode of operation on n calls to a compression function. And the ST complexity of, copy of computing this function square root n times was really not much more than computing it once. 
So the point is, ST complexity, is, it's good for one-off computation, for understanding one-off computation, but it's not useful, or it's not, it, it's not a very good notion when you want to do amortized complexity for parallel computation. So we need something else, and the, maybe the natural thing to do, so ST complexity, you can think of it like this. There's, uh, again, a, a computation, uh, the, the space, the space uh, curve over time. ST complexity would be the area of the entire box. And kind of the natural thing, given the previous argument, is to just restrict ourselves to look at the area under the curve. So as long as you can't really reuse computation across instances, reuse calls to your you know, storage and reuse calls to your compression function, you can hope for nice amortization. So the, the, the complexity should scale linearly, essentially, in the number of instances that you're computing. That's really what we want. And for that, we look at cumulative memory complexity which is essentially, you can think of it as the, time, the sum of the amount of memory across time that your algorithm is storing. So in order to reason about cumulative memory complexity, in particular in the random oracle model, um, a very useful simplified compu computational model has been uh, developed, which is the parallel pebbling game. So this builds on the, the black pebbling game from the 70s, and intuitively it models parallel computation. So the idea is, that this is, a, this is a computational model over a DAG, directed acyclic graph, and it involves just putting pebbles on the nodes of graphs, uh, of, of the nodes of the graph. And um, this is done iteratively, so one round at a time. And the goal of the game is simply to place a pebble on the sink of the graph, on the last node of the graph. Okay? For simplicity, we just think of graphs with one source, one sink. And there's really only two rules that govern how you can place these pebbles. And the most important rule is you can only place a pebble on a node V if at the, by the end of the previous round, all the parent nodes of V already have a pebble on them. And the second rule is you can remove a pebble whenever you want. So just to give you an example, just so that this is like quite clear how this works, here's this very simple DAG, four nodes, okay? And we're gonna look at how a pebbling would work. Okay, in the first step, you place a pebble on the sink, on the source, right? It has no parents, so you can always place pebbles on sources. Now, in the next step, we can immediately place a pebble on the children of the sink because, both of, because their parents are already covered. And at the same time, in the same step, we can remove the pebble on the source. The next step, we can do the same for the sink, and we're done, right? So the, the complexity notion we look at here for this pebbling game mirrors cumulative memory complexity, and we call it also a similar name, cumulative pebbling complexity. And it's simply the sum of the number of pebbles on the graph across the number of steps, across the steps. So in that case, that pebbling had CPC of four. So you can already see that there's like a strong parallel here between an, how you would hope uh, computation works in the parallel random oracle model and the pebbling game. And the, so the pebbling game really serves as a way to simplify the analysis of different functions. And armed with this, uh, peb with this complexity notion for graphs, we can you know, uh, define the complexity notion for a graph, and that's simply the, the minimum pebbling complexity of any complete and legal pebbling of a given graph. Right? So this is the CPC of a graph. And much of this talk is going to be about l looking at the CPC at and understanding the CPC of different graphs. And the reason for that is the following theorem, which is uh, from a previous work, which basically states, you don't really have to parse it too much, but what it says is that for a class of functions, which we call hash graphs, um, really the only thing you can do in the parallel random Markle model is essentially pebble the graph. You can just compute labels in this hash graph um, according to a pebbling. And that's what this theorem says. And so what it means is that we don't have to think about the parallel random oracle model anymore for this entire class of functions, for these potentially memory hard functions. All we have to do is we look at the underlying graph which describes the mode of operation for these functions and we analyze the properties of the graph, namely its CPC. That's all we have to do. And so that's what we're gonna do in this talk. And so given this theorem, we really have two goals now on the one hand in terms of attacks, on the other one hand in terms of security proofs. For security proofs, what we're looking for is a constant in-degree graph with high CPC. Now the reason for constant in-degree is because we're looking at uh, the mode of operation over compression function. And 
kind of in the random oracle model, the implicit assumption here is when you want to call your round function, your, your compression function, you really have to have everything in memory in one go. That's just how we model things in the random oracle model. And in order not to break that, we don't want to have too big of inputs so that the random oracle model is still relevant in practice when you replace your random oracle with some hash function, cryptographic hash function. So this is why we're looking at constant in-degree graphs. Otherwise, we'd be done. The fully connected DAG so it, you know, is already going to have as good CPC as you could ever hope. But we, we need constant in-degree for this to make sense. And indeed, all constructions are constant in-degree. The other thing in terms of attacks that we want is to find uh, low CPC pebbling strategies. So previous results on CPC, uh, remember there's many constructions. I've highlighted some, what we know about some of the most important uh, functions, in particular Argon2 um, was the winner of the password hashing competition, so that's important. Katena was one of the earliest ones. And for now, we've, we've, up till now, we've mainly known about, low, about uh, upper bounds. So that would be attacks in some sense. And the best, by the way, you can hope for of any function, any mode of operation on n calls to uh, um, a compression function is for CPC of n squared. That's the best you could ever hope for. And that's just doing things sequentially in topological order and remembering everything, keeping pebbles everywhere. So as we'll see in the next script, uh, in the next talk, uh, well, OK, I won't say too much about that. So, um, the only thing we've, we've got in terms of uh, security proofs is for uh, AS15. This was a very theoretical construction, but we got pretty close. We got polylog. Asymptotically, this looks good. The problem is that for practical values of n, log to the 10 is like, that's like square root n, because okay, so that's actually pretty far away from n squared. So in this work, we developed several new techniques for both uh, attacks and for new security proofs. And in particular, we tightened the gap, what we know about certain functions, in particular, argon2i a and b. Um, there's new, the new version is argon2i b. That's the, the newest version of argon2i. And um, maybe the most interesting, in a theoretical sense, is that we have an asymptotically almost optimal construction now. So a graph that has as high CPC as you could hope for. And the reason I say high C, as high as you could hope for is because of this result here, which shows that any graph on n nodes, you can't get n squared, right? You can, the most you can get is n squared over log, uh, log n, effectively. And in this, we, in this work, we construct n squared over log n. And the way we do that is by analyzing, uh, using a combinatorial property of graphs called depth robustness. And what depth robustness is, it's the following property. Given a graph uh, G, we say that it's ED depth robust if you can, any subset of nodes that you remove of size E, so any E nodes that you remove, there will remain a path of length D. So this is a combinatorial property. And what we do is we, this is the, kind of the main theorem, we show the following theorem, which says that if a graph is ED depth robust, then the CPC of the graph is greater than e times d. So given this theorem, really um, all we need to do is now find a graph that has high CPC, and, uh, sorry, has high depth robustness, and Erdős Graham Semeredi already gave us such a construction. So this is using quite an old result. The only problem with that construction is that it didn't have constant in degree. So the other thing we do um, in, in, uh, for this is to show how to reduce the in-degree of a graph without paying too much in depth robustness. So combining those two results, this lemma and this theorem, we end up with at least theoretically asymptotically optimal construction um, for a, a graph with high CPC and therefore an IMHF. Um, the other thing we do is, uh, well, we do several other things. Um, in particular, show some lower bounds uh, for known constructions. So what that boils down to is looking at the depth robustness of the graphs that underlie those constructions, and also another combinatorial property that we identify, which we call dispersal, um, which also gives you some bounds on the CPC of a graph. We analyze that as well. And um, we also take um, a, a, a pebbling strategy, a previous one, um, which gives you low CPC uh, uh, pebblings for certain kinds of graphs. And we improve on it by sort of looking at it recursively, see if we can apply it recursively. And indeed, that gives us improved attacks, in some sense, on some known IMHFs. All right. 
I think that's it. Time's up for now. <laughs> Questions? Uh, so I'll start with one. Uh, the, uh, you didn't formulate uh, any statements about uh, uh, hardness for the adversary that follows from the depth robust robustness. Um, so the hardness for the adversary is, um, Essentially, you have that it's high CMC, right? So that's cumulative memory complexity in the parallel random oracle model. That's sort of the hardness notion for the adversary. And then there's this result um, from the past work that shows that if you have a graph that has high CPC, you can turn it into an IMHF that has high CMC in the random oracle model. And then one of the key theorems we show is that if a graph is very depth robust, then it has high CPC. So plugging that chain together, you end up with an IMHF that has high CMC. For example, the adversary has ability to uh, choose its own inputs in many applications. Is it something that your uh, security statements capture? Indeed, indeed. Um, I've glossed over the fact that cumulative memory complexity, uh, we actually, we, we look at the amortized cumulative memory complexity of a function. So really the game is in the parallel random oracle model is you allow the adversary to choose how many inputs he wants to evaluate and what the inputs are, and then he runs the computation, and then you look at the uh, amortized complexity per, per I-O pair that he computes. So, yeah, I kind of glossed over that, but yeah, he, it does capture that. We've got a question. Oh, what, one sec, one sec. Would you repeat the question? You, got, you have an example for uh, why you can't get past the factor four? Um, it's, n it's tight. Okay, again, that's actually the simplified version of that theorem statement. And in reality, um, the quality of the theorem of, of, of that reduction decreases in things like how many random oracle calls does the adversary make? What's his probability? So the way it's formulated there is tight for some choice of parameters, but not in the general case is, is a more complicated equation. So yes and no, basically. <laughs> 